Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about bones and sex and skulls and childbirth and dimorphism and castration. We're going to follow that outline right up above my little yellow box as we discuss physical anthropology, specifically looking at skeletal anatomy and human biology. So put that outline in your notes to serve as a framework for the information that is to follow. But before we get into that information, I want to start with a warning. We are going to talk about some pretty sensitive topics over the next few sections. Sex and gender, race and ancestry, the evolution of the human form, the violence that can be done against it. We're going to talk about the human body, naked and unadorned of many of the trappings of culture. And to do that, we have to kind of maintain a very scientific perspective, which is what I'm going to try to do. Physical anthropology is the most scientific of all of the subfields of anthropology. And when we talk about things that are very sensitive, it is important to keep a mature attitude and an open mind as we discuss the human physical body. All right, so what exactly is the human physical form? That is the human body there on the lower left. The human body can be classified as possessing 11 different organ systems. And that's them across the top. And physical anthropology addresses all of these, although it mostly focuses on skeletal anatomy. So before we get into that very quickly, let's actually talk about the 11 organ systems of the human body. We have uh, the integumentary system, which is, of course, the skin. We have the muscular system, which is all the muscles of the body, the smooth muscles, the cardiac and the skeletal muscles. We have the skeletal system itself, which we'll talk a lot about in the next few bits. There's the nervous uh, system, which is, of course, the brain, the spinal column, and all of the nerves. There is the endocrine system, which is glands that release secretions, which change the shape of the human body. We have the circulatory system and the veins and the arteries and the heart that move blood around the system. Uh, we've got the lymphatic system, which moves lymphs around the human body. The respiratory system, which allows us to breathe. That's the lungs and the mouth and the larynx. We have the digestive system, which allows us to extract nutrients from food. The urinary system, by which we purge wastes from the human body. And finally, the reproductive system, or uh, the system that allows us to reproduce and make more uh, tiny little humans everywhere. And again, physical anthropology addresses all of these things, but mostly focuses on the skeletal anatomy. So let's actually look at the human skeletal system. Uh, there is the human body, both in its fully fleshy and defleshed states. This is the human skeletal system. Now, the human skeletal system consists of a rigid infrastructure of the body itself. Bones are the most durable portion of the human body, and they are the parts we know the most about, especially in terms of evolutionary development. You know, after a million years or so, pretty much the bones are all that's going to be left, and very little else of the other 10 systems will remain. Long after you and I die, our skeletons will be the last bits of us to exist. Now, the skeleton itself is basically uh, comprised of three sections. The appendicular skeleton, the axial skeleton, and the skull. The appendicular skeleton is the long bones of the arms, legs, shoulders, and pelvis. The axial skeleton are the bones of the body's axis, the spinal column, the ribs, the sternum. And finally, there is just the skull, which is, of course, the bones of the head. Now, there are roughly 206 bones in the human body, but to be honest, this number changes over time. As you are born, bo bones fuse together. So you're actually born with more bones, and as you age, you have fewer bones, because different bones kind of fuse together. Uh, so the number, the exact number of bones will change over the course of your lifetime. And let's actually sit and review the human skeletal system. There is the human skeleton. So I would sketch that down in your notes, and we're going to run through the major skeletal elements. That is the cranium. It is the skull minus the mandible. Then we have the mandible. And then finally, there is the scapula, uh, the sternum. Uh, then there are the, the two humeri, the, the arm uh, bones of the upper arm. Uh, the radius, which is the bones of the lower arm, and the radius is the one that sort of moves in a semicircle. The more rigid uh, bone of the lower arm is the ulna. All right. And then you have, of course, 
the carpals and the metacarpals, the bones respectively of the wrist and hand. And then finally you have the phalanges. You've got four different sets of phalanges because phalanges are both fingers and toes. And then you, of course, you have got the vertebral column, which is there. And that is, of course, all the vertebra, which encase uh, the spine, uh, encase the, the central nervous system. Then you have, of course, the ribs, and you have more than one set of ribs, but you only have to label them once because uh, you know where the ribs are. Uh, then there is the innominate, which are the two sides of the pelvis. And actually, the innominate is made up of several bones in and of itself. But for our purposes here, we're just going to call it the innominate, also called the ox coxa. Uh, there, there, of course, your pair of femurs, uh, a pair of patellas, the knee bone. You have the bone, the weight-bearing bone of the lower leg, which is the tibia. It's right there. Uh, and then finally, uh, you have the fibula, which is the non-weight-bearing bone of the lower leg. And then, of course, uh, the bones of the ankle and foot, tarsals and metatarsals. So this should give you a good idea of all of the different bones of the human body. And different bones uh, can provide different information depending on what questions you're asking at any given time. But the thing is, is that there is a stark difference between both male and female skeletons. You have different skeletal architecture for each of the two biological sexes of uh, the human species. Humans are sexually dimorphic with two biological sexes. You have biological males, biological females. Humans have a pronounced degree of sexual dimorphism. So you know it's important because it's in all caps. Sexual dimorphism is the structural differences between the sexes. And it's not as pronounced as some vertebrates, but humans have a fairly significant degree of sexual dimorphism. It's, I mean, it's a significant degree of, of sexual dimorphism. There's differences between the sexes. Let's actually look at really extreme versions of sexual dimorphism. Uh, angler fish and elephant seals. Uh, there on the upper left, that's an angler fish. And the really big, the really big one that the, the, the researcher is holding, that's the female of the species, the pretty, pretty lady. And the tiny little one in the fingers, that's the biological male of the anglerfish. So there is a huge difference between the two biological sexes of anglerfish. As a matter of fact, the uh, male anglerfish will bite the female and uh, ab ab be absorbed into the outer coating of the female and she will digest a lot of, uh, of the male body until he becomes a parasitic set of gonads attached to the exterior of the female. And in fact, females can have several sets of parasitic gonads. That's extreme sexual dimorphism. But let's get out of like weird fish that live at the bottom of the ocean and talk about elephant seals. There's the male and the female elephant seal. And again, there is a huge difference in the size between the two. It's very, very easy to tell the male from the female. As a matter of fact, uh, when elephant seals mate, they actually have to do it from the side because the male is so much larger, he can actually crush the female during the mating process. And I always feel bad for elephant seals because the females are always so dainty and graceful and the males of the elephant seals just, just they just look awful. It's just, it's so, so ugly. So let's do, let's look at other species that do not have pronounced sexual dimorphic characteristics. What do we have here? What is in this picture? The answer is freedom. Freedom is in this photograph. I'm just joking. These are bald eagles, of course. And I want you to look at A and B, and I want you to try to figure out which is the male and which is the female bald eagle. And put that in your notes, because I'll give you all the answers later. A is, is A the female or is B the male? Or is A the male or is B the female? And let's we're going to go through a series of, of animals like this. There's the lassie dog. Which is the male and which is the female? Put it in your notes. Sparrows. Which is the male? Which is the female? Put it in your notes. Look at the image, try to figure out which one is which, and put it down there. Chimpanzees. Which is the male and which is the female? Evaluate how they look. Judge the degree of sexual dimorphism and decide which is the male and female. Now, 
Uh, the answers for all of the above, A is always female on those answers, and B was always male. How did you do? Um, on the sparrow and the dog and the eagle and the chimpanzees, Bs were all male, As were all female. Now let's go back to humans. Which is the male and which is the female? Now you should be able to tell because humans have a significant degree of sexual dimorphism. Humans are more sexually dimorphic than chimpanzees, uh, sparrows, eagles, or lassie dogs. Uh, but they're not as sexually dimorphic as anglerfish or elephant seals. Uh, but you can obviously tell, even unadorned of many of the trappings of culture, you can still tell males from females in the vast majority of cases. And this difference, this, these dimorphic characteristics, go all the way down to the skeletal architecture. Here are both uh, individuals reduced to skeletal elements. And overall, uh, female humans are much smaller and more gracile than their male counterparts. Sexual dimorphism is more pronounced and hence easier to determine among European and African populations than it is among Asian populations. However, uh, before we move into that, we have to talk about that the sexual determination of the skeleton can really only take place after adolescence. Uh, it is virtually impossible, although it is not totally impossible, it is very, very difficult to determine the biological sex of individuals uh, prior to adolescence, especially based on skeletal material alone. There are a number of specific markers on the skeletal architecture that allows us to tell the difference between males and females. And forensic scientists do this like all the time. The most sexually dimorphic bones in the human body are the anominates, the bones of the pelvis. And the pelvic bones have three really specific markers that allows you to distinguish between males and females. Uh, the top is the male, the bottom is the female. And these three markers are overall shape, the subpubic angle, and the greater sciatic notch. First off, there is the overall shape. If you look at the male pelvis at the top, the male pelvis tends to be more like a V. It tends to be more rigid, the bones tend to be more robust. The female pelvis tends to be more curved and in a kind of W shape, as you can see right there. Then you have the subpubic angle. On the male pelvis, it tends to be triangular. On the female pelvis, the subpubic angle tends to be arched. Okay, but the greatest indicator of biological sex on the pelvis, and indeed the greatest indicator of biological sex in the entire human skeleton, is the greater sciatic notch. The greater sciatic notch is there and there. And on biological males, the greater sciatic notch tends to be narrow and shallow. Narrow and shallow. On female pelvises, it tends to be wide and deep, all right? There is no indicator on the body that is a clearer marker of a biological sex than the greater sciatic notch. So let's actually move on to a real example. Let's look at that pelvis right above me. There's your anominates, there's your coccyx. Is this a male or a female pelvis? Look at the overall shape. Is it a V or is it more of a W? Look at the subpubic angle. Is it more triangular or is it more arched? And unfortunately in this photograph, you can't really see the greater sciatic notch very well, but look at it and put it in your notes. Is this male or is this female? Now, uh, the difference in pelvic architecture has to do with childbirth. Uh, and generally when I give this lecture in front of a bunch of students, this is the part where about half of the female uh, students in the class kind of cross their legs. Uh, because, of course, the human infant must pass through the female pelvis, which means that the pelvis has to be, has to accommodate the passage of the infant, uh, which means it has to move through. And during uh, childbirth, especially in the lead, in, in during pregnancy, in fact, during the second trimester, the female's body will begin to soften the bones of the pelvis in order to make the childbirth uh, more likely, more likely to succeed. The pelvis begins to soften and it becomes more elastic. This softening and then subsequent rehardening creates something called 
parturition marks. Parturition marks are generally located there, uh, there, and there. And these are basically the notches left on the pelvic architecture after the second trimester of pregnancy. Each pregnancy, even if the childbirth is unsuccessful, will leave a separate set of parturition marks. So an individual could, uh, a mother could give birth to twins, but because that's a single pregnancy, it's only one set of parturition marks. A female could have three pregnancies, but only two of the pregnancies were successful, but she will still have three different sets of overlapping parturition marks. And of course, male pelvises cannot obtain parturition marks. Therefore, parturition marks, when present, are a better indicator of biological sex than even the greater sciatic notch. But the thing is, is that the greater sciatic notch is always there. Uh, parturition marks aren't always. Moving on to the skull. Outside of the pelvis, it is the skull that has the most sexually dimorphic elements. And in uh, the, the architecture of the skull, there are again, four things that really indicate biological sex on the skull. First off, there is the overall shape. And in the two skulls right up above me, uh, it is the male on the left and the female on the right. First off, the overall shape. The male skull tends to be larger. It tends to be more robust. The female skull tends to be smaller and it tends to be more gracile. Uh, there is the mandible. The mandible of the male skull tends to be more robust. It tends to be more angular. The mandible of the female skull tends to begin more gracile and more curved. There are brow ridges. The male skull generally possesses a set of raised, in, of raised bumps just above the orbits of the eye right there. These things are called brow ridges. They're a really good indicator of biological sex because their presence generally indicates this is a male. Um, although there are a small number of female skulls that do have brow ridges, the absence of these brow ridges is a very clear indicator of uh, it's a biological female. So in that female skull right up above me, the brow ridges would be located about there, but of course they're completely absent. Uh, the absence of, of brow ridges is a really good indicator of uh, it's a biological female. And lastly, the best indicator of biological sex on the skull is the mastoid process. There it is on the male skull and the female skull. Uh, the male skulls, uh, the, the, the mastoid process is located right about here. It's right behind the ear. In fact, you can feel it and kind of thump it right there. The mastoid process on the male skulls tends to be larger and it tends to be down lower whereas the mastoid process on the female skulls tends to be smaller and it tends to be higher up in the body. And basically the mastoid process is a muscle attachment for a big muscle that runs right here called the sternocleidomastoid. And uh, before we leave the skull, uh, before we leave these skulls, but I, I do wanna say one more thing. The skull is not a good uh, indicator of biological sex um, as the pelvis. So you can't really rely on a single skeletal feature of the skull, but rather you have to take all four of these things into account because there are biological females that have, you know, robust mandibles. There are biological males that have gracile mandibles. There are biological males that have small mastoid processes. There are biological females that have large mastoid processes. So in terms of the skull, you have to take all four attributes into account when you're determining, you know, the biological sex of like a set of human remains, for instance. Uh, so let's actually look at a set of human remains. There we have a skull right up above me. And I want you to look at this skull and determine what biological sex is on this skull. Does it have brow ridges? Is it more gracile or more robust? Is the mandible more angled and more robust or is it more curved and more gracile. The mastoid process, the best indicator of uh, sex on the skull is the mastoid process, there it is. Is the mastoid process large or is it small? And write down whether this is a male or a female skull. But 
there's an important thing about biological sex. And I've tried to be very, very precise with my terminology as we move through this, because there is a difference between sex and gender. Sex refers to biological sex, of which there are two unalterable sets, male and female. The difference goes all the way down to the genetic level. Females have double X chromosomes, males have XY chromosomes. The really interesting thing is that all human fetuses actually start out as female. Males are not differentiated uh, until the second month of gestation. So all men, all males, inside you, you have an, you have an inner female inside you. But the, the reverse is not true. All right, now we're going to apply culture to uh, the human body. Gender, on the other hand, is a culturally and socially constructed category that is built on the foundation of biological sex. Uh, there are no human societies that lack the concept of culture, and all human societies have at least two genders, although there are a large number of societies that have more than two. Now, a gender itself exists along a grammar, which are basically loose rules of localized behaviors and features, and every culture has idealized concepts of both male and female. Right up above me, the perfect male, the perfect female, or the perfect man, the perfect woman. I have to watch my language. Individual humans interpret these localized ideals onto themselves and follow these grammars as best they can in order to communicate their gender to the people around them, to the society around them. And there we go, man and woman right up above me. So male and female refers to sex, man and woman refers uh, to gender. Masculinity or femininity determines a full set of cosmetic features, how you dress, one's role in a larger society, how you behave in any given situation. Unlike sex, uh, gender can be changed. So you have gender reassignment surgery, but sex reassignment surgery is a, uh, it's an impossibility. Uh, but different human cultural groups may possess more than two genders. In fact, you have some cultural groups that have third, fourth, even fifth genders, or they have individuals that have been stripped of gender uh, completely, especially like really, really old people uh, somehow uh, become stripped of, of gender altogether. Now, I'm using the term grammar to describe a loose set of rules, uh, and that's a very, very specific way because grammar operates with gender much the same way it operates with, say, the English language. It is a set of rules. You don't have to follow all of the rules all of the time in order to communicate, but you have to follow most of them. And if you break all of the rules, then you're not communicating. You're not, you know, communicating clearly, and you're going to really confuse people. So grammar is used here with gender much the same way it's used with language. There are certain rules. They don't all have to be followed, and you can break some of the rules. But if you break them all, you can be a man and you can wear a skirt or a kilt. You can be a man and have long hair and makeup. But if you break all of the rules, then you're, then you're Dr. Frankenfurter right up above me. Uh, you're just really going to confuse people. They're not going to know what gender you're trying to communicate to them. Gender is itself not necessarily a, a personal decision, but it is, it is instead collectively constructed by society. It is a type of communication. Gender is performative. It requires both an actor and an audience. Uh, and we know that gender is socially constructed because different human societies construct gender differently. Here we have, uh, right here, every single one of these individuals around me, these are all biologically male. This is the Katui, the third gender of Thailand. And Katui are biological males who adopt a kind of hyper-feminized persona, adopt a hyper-feminine uh, gender identity. Uh, but all of these individuals are biologically male. They would have larger mastoid processes. They would have brow ridges. They would have V-shaped pelvises, triangular subpubic angles, and small, uh, greater sciatic notches. But that's just their biological sex. Their gender is Katui. 
They are not men pretending to be women. They are Kachui, a completely third gender. At any rate, I would argue that Western civilization used to possess a third gender. Up until the 20th century, uh, Western civilization, especially Italy, uh, had a third gender. These were eunuchs, castrati. And these are a pair of castrati right up above me. And castrati were surgically altered males who were castrated in order to preserve really powerful, youthful singing voices. So they would be young singers who would have these really high-pitched soprano and falsetto voices. They would then be castrated prior to adolescence. So they would grow to have big male lungs, but their voices would never change. So the result is, is that castrati could hit these really high notes and hold these notes far longer than any female. And castrati existed. Like uh, some of them were, were quite famous celebrities in their day, like Carlo Scalzi in the 18th century or Alessandro Moreschi in the late 19th century. And the thing about castrati was that they were not considered either men or women in European society. And they could take and uh, leave lovers of either gender. And in fact, you, you had men who became the lovers of castrati but by Italian society were not considered homosexual. They could be partnered with a castrati in a way that a man could not be partnered with another man. This is why I make the argument that castrati were uh, the third gender of Europe. And anyway, this is one of the important things you need to, to remember. Gender cannot be determined through skeletal analysis alone. If you're just looking at a set of human remains, you cannot determine gender. You cannot determine this was a man, this was a woman, this was a katui, this was a castrati. You can't determine any of that. You can only determine male or female. You can only determine biological sex. Bones themselves, ribs, femurs, humeruses, pelvises, you know, craniums, bones do not have gender. Only individuals have gender. Now, outside of the skull, outside of the pelvis, the other bones of the human body are not terribly sexually dimorphic. There are very subtle hints in some of the bones. You know, the females tend to be more gracile, males tend to be more uh, robust. But it takes a really, really experienced uh, osteologist or forensic anthropologist to sexually, di sexually differentiate like femurs and humeruses. I'm not saying it can't be done. You just have to be really, really good at what you're doing. You have to be far better than I am. Uh, especially bones of the appendicular skeleton uh, cannot consistently be used to determine biological sex. It takes somebody really experienced to determine that. And especially, you know, if, if the bones look like they do right up above me, you know, if they're very, if the individual is disarticulated, if the bones have a lot of wear on them, it's very, very difficult to determine biological sex uh, on these very, very worn bones, especially if you're lacking a skull um, and a pelvis. It's very difficult. And we're going to move on from sex and gender. We're going to move on to race, ancestry, and other parts of the skeletal anatomy in the next lecture. And I will see you there.